great. Um, hello, everyone. Hello and happy day two of the Convention on Cluster Munition. I'm Sarah Gulabdara with Legacies of War. Legacies of War is an advocacy and education organization based right here in Washington, DC. We advocate for US funds for unexploded ordnance clearance, unexploded ordnance clearance program, uh, mine risk education, and victims assistance in Laos, Cambodia, and Vietnam. We also educate the public about the history of the American secret war, as well as the broader conflict um, during the Vietnam War era. Legacies, Legacies of War is passionately supports the global ban of cluster munition and is a proud member of ICBL CMC. We also serve as a steering committee member of the US CBL CMC. I'm honored to be our moderator for today's very special SCI event, Embedding Environmental Protection and Alignment with the Lausanne Action Plan. Before I kick us off, I wanna share that we'll be conducting a poll before each speaker. And these are very short, thoughtful questions, and we encourage you to participate. I also wanna remind the audience uh, to please type any questions that you may have, and I'll do my very best to ask your questions during our Q&A portion. For those live tweeting, and I encourage you to do this, please be sure to use the hashtag CCM10MSP, that's CCM10MSP, and tag all of our organizations, and we'll be happy to amplify that. With that, let's get started. Our first speaker today is Lucy Pinches. Lucy is project manager of the Mine Action Review, which is an independent project published by NPA. The Mine Action Review monitors and analyzes survey and clearance of anti-personnel mine and cluster, cluster munition remnant contamination globally. Lucy joined the Mine Action Review project in 2015 and prior to that, worked for ICBL CMC and the private sector. She has a master's degree with distinction, I might add, in global governance and ethics from University College London and a first class honors degree in environmental science. Woo, um, very impressive resume indeed. Um, Lucy will be sharing an overview of how environment is addressed in the Convention on Cluster Munitions the Lausanne Action Plan, and International Mine Standards, or IMAS, findings um, from Mine Action Review's country-level research on the environment. Lucy, you're out, you're live. Great, thank you very much, Sarah, and to uh, MPA and CEOBS for uh, organizing this side event. Uh, welcome to everyone that's joining us virtually um, in the margins of the Conventional Cluster Munitions meeting. Um, so as Sarah says, I'm just going to uh, give an overview of how environments addressed within the convention, the Lausanne Action Plan, and then some of our own mine action review findings. So uh, next slide, please. So kicking off, first of all, with um, what the conventional cluster munitions actually says in the treaty text. Um, there's very limited environmental obligations in the text itself. Um, with respect to stockpile destruction, it requires that each state party undertakes to ensure that destruction methods comply with applicable international standards for protecting public health and the environment. And uh, state parties also need to report in their Article 7 transparency reports on what environmental standards they observe for stockpile destruction. Next slide, please. Then with regards to clearance, um, the CCM requires that each state party sets out, amongst other things, the environmental implications of uh, deadline clearance uh, extension requests. However, um, when the environment is referenced in a state parties extension requests, it's normally very brief and this is something that we actually hope will improve in future uh, extension requests that we see. Next slide please. Um, so moving to the Lausanne Action Plan and the environment. So the Lausanne Action Plan is uh, the five-year action plan that was adopted under the Convention on Cluster Munitions under Switzerland's presidency of the Second Review Conference last year. And it actually um, includes uh, lots of references to the environment, which is a very positive uh, development for the mine action sector. 
Um, and it includes uh, action eight, which requires uh, state parties to make synergies and coordinate responses uh, with environmental protection um, instruments. And then uh, uh, actions 12 and 14 ensure that stockpile destruction methods are in compliance with international standards for the protection of public health and the environment, and also that stockpiles are destroyed with minimal environmental impact. Moving to survey and clearance, actions 21 and 23 of the action plan require that survey and clearance methodologies take into account environmental impacts and concerns. And then uh, action 30, uh, which is on 30 and 31, in fact, that is on uh, risk education, um, also has uh, environmental uh, uh, references to it, as does uh, 39 on international cooperation and assistance, and that encourages um, cooperation and exchange of best practices on environmental impact assessments and uh, environmental protection considerations. Next slide, please. So, um, the focus of a mine action review as a project is on survey and clearance. So I'm going to take a few minutes just to kind of focus a little bit more in depth on uh, action 21 of the Lost Land Action Plan and exactly what it does require of um, state parties. So the action point includes um, the importance of taking into account international standards, um, which of course include uh, IMAS 713, which is on environmental management in mine action. Um, just to say a few words about that IMAS, it was published in 2017, and it recognises that shortcomings in environmental management can cause adverse short and long term environmental impacts and result in direct harm to affected communities and potentially reduce some of the positive uh, and expected outcomes um, that arise from mine action operations. It was agreed by the IMAS steering group in June this year that this uh, IMAS on the environment is going to be reviewed and updated, which is great. And we're probably looking at um, those updates uh, flowing through to the actual IMAS sometime next year. The corresponding um, indicator for this uh, action point uh, doesn't uh, include reference to the environment, so we can't currently kind of say what the baseline is with respect to action 21. But um, Mine Action Review has conducted country specific research on uh, the environment for the first time this year. Uh, next slide please. So our country research this year follows on from um, a policy brief that Mine Action Review published last year on mitigating the environmental impacts of explosive ordnance and land release. It was published uh, last October and is available on the homepage of the Mine Action Review website. And we hope that this policy briefing is a, a useful resource for, for the sector. It produces um, an overview, it provides an overview of the environmental impact uh, norms and standards, uh, environmental mitigation measures, and also um, su suggestions on the way forward. Next slide, please. Um, so then in terms of our country level research, for this year we wanted to kind of set a baseline of where the sector is in terms of mine action and the environment on the survey and clearance side. So in all of our correspondence and questionnaires that we send uh, to national authorities, to clearance operators, UNMAS, UNDP, Geneva Centre, all stakeholders, we ask, um, we have a set, ask questions that will contribute towards a section on environmental policies and uh, mine action. And this um, uh, new section includes uh, considerations such as whether states have a national mine action standard on the environment, whether national authorities and their implementing partners um, uh, have an environmental management system in place, and also how, if at all, is the environment being taken into consideration during the planning and tasking process for survey and clearance of cluster munition remnants in order to minimise potential harm from demining activities. So between uh, this year's Clearing Cluster Munition Remnants report and the Clearing the Mines report, which will be published in November, we really hope to set a baseline of um, what's happening in uh, affected countries with regards to the environment and how they're taking it into account in their survey and clearance programmes. 
Next slide, please. So um, we don't have time to present the full findings, which are included in the report, um, but I'll just highlight some of the key ones. So we believe that out of the cluster munition affected states um, that have, uh, these are the ones that have a uh, national mine action standard on the environment or else make reference to environmental considerations in their national mine action standards, albeit to a very varying extent. So of the CCM state parties, Afghanistan and Laos PDR have a national mine action standard specifically on the environment. Um, and then Lebanon has a national mine action standard on safety and occupational health and the protection of the environment. Then there is actually efforts happening in other state parties, such as Bosnia and Herzegovina. It doesn't have an NMAS, but it does uh, have limitations, for example, on certain machines being banned from clearing agricultural areas because they disturb soil deeper than 20 centimetres. They compact it um, and it leaves the soil impermeable to water and prevents um, sowing for up to three years. And similarly, uh, machines aren't used on mountain pastures in order to um, protect uh, against removal of layers of grasses that have taken uh, many years to grow. Uh, in Germany, for example, the protection of the environment is considered in the federal guidelines for the clearance of explosive ordnance. And then um, there's also some very good initiatives in states not party to the convention too. Um, and I'll just highlight maybe one of those, uh, and that's Azerbaijan. So Azerbaijan uh, has just revised all of its national mine action standards, um, which it will be adopting this year, and it's shared with operators already. And the new standards actually include a dedicated chapter on environmental protection. Um, and this includes, amongst other things, requirements for the identification, assessment, and mitigation of environmental aspects. And those environmental aspects include waste disposal, water supplies, uh, burning and removal of vegetation, open burning and demolition, environmental aspects of uh, mechanical mine clearance operations, and more. So that uh, sounds like it's a very comprehensive uh, new uh, NMAS, which is great. And then, uh, next slide, please. Just touching briefly on um, what uh, operators and others are doing. So there's really some excellent examples of initiatives being taken by uh, clearance operators to mitigate environmental harm in surveying clearance. Um, Often clearance operators have environmental policies in place at headquarters. Some of these are being elaborated now or strengthened. And um, sometimes they have dedicated SOPs on the environment in their country programs. And there's a range of measures that are being taken place. I'm sure um, uh, MPA and HALO will touch on uh, some of these themselves, but we see things like installing solar panels, recycling of plastics, not removing or burning vegetation um, unnecessary, and um, taking care like not to contaminate water sources with fuels, lubricants, um, etc. So I think I'll leave it at that because I'm uh, looking forward to hearing from um, the operators directly. Thanks, Sarah. Excellent. Thank you so much, Lucy. That was very comprehensive. And I might add, thank you for the Mine Action Review. Uh, we use it at Legacies all the time. So um, before we move forward uh, to our next uh, two speakers, uh, our dynamic duo, um, I just wanted to pause and see if we want to kick off our first poll, Lindsay. All right, you have one minute uh, to complete the poll. We're almost there, halfway through. Looks like everyone's taking actions. Give it just another couple seconds. We should have had some sound, uh, Jeopardy music. Okay, uh, five, four, three, two, one.
Okay, thanks so much for everyone for participating in that. Um, next up, uh, we um, have the honor of introducing um, Kristen Home Oberstad. Kristen is a senior advisor on climate and environment in Norwegian People's Aid. Kristen just started her role at NPA in August, so this month, um, and will lead the development of NPA's approach to climate, uh, climate conflict and environment on both a policy and operational level. The first five years, she's been working for NPA trade union, um, I'm sorry, Norwegian trade union as a political advisor on climate, environment, and sustainability, and has been responsible for greening the organization. She previously worked seven years for NPA on program follow-up and gender and environment, among others, in addition to policy, policy work, including the UN treaty banning nuclear weapons. Thank you for that. Prior to that, she worked in, foreign, in the foreign ministry with humani humanitarian disarmament and has a master's degree in political science. Welcome, Kristen. And also joining Kristen uh, in the next, um, uh, next presentation is her colleague, um, Bak Bui Zhuang. Bak studied undergraduate in Canada with expertise in environment technique, focusing on environment impact assessment, environment monitoring and remediation. He spent his first couple of years working for a local NGO where he managed projects under USAID fund for studying ocean plastic pollution in conserve areas and on solid waste reduction and management in urban settings. He also provides lectures on plastic and circular economics to international schools in Vietnam. Um, excuse me. Uh, Beck joined NPA Vietnam in 2020 and started developing strategy action plan and field project for the program to reduce environmental footprint and support civilians and climate change resiliency as an inclusion of mine action operation. He now represents NPA Vietnam in chairing the Environment Task Force of Vietnam Mine Action Working Group with the objective of promoting environment and climate change in mine action in Vietnam. So Kristen and Bak will be um, sharing NPA's initiatives to date, priorities uh, going forward, and NPA Vietnam's initiative. Um, Kristen and Bak, welcome. Thank you so much uh, for the introduction, Sarah, and good afternoon from Oslo, everyone. Um, next slide, please. First, let me just start with saying that it is it's extremely positive that environmental concerns are getting more prominent across the sector and that the Lausanne Action Plan so clearly outlines commitments about the need to consider environmental impacts. Now we just, just need to make sure that we actually walk the talk. Um, and in NPA, we, are strongly, we strongly believe that the environment is interconnected with our humanitarian demining work, because it is clear that munitions can have a negative impact on the environment. And as a humanitarian organization, we do have a responsibility to mitigate any potential negative impact from our work. And climate change will impact our mine action activities. Next slide, please. NPA's ambition, ambitions are to assess and mitigate potential negative environmental impacts and risks and strengthening the positive ones. So to do so, we are taking the necessary steps to reduce our carbon and environmental footprint by setting realistic and tangible targets. And we also need to analyze the effects of climate change and possible environmental damage of our work and adjust accordingly. And we believe that mainstreaming the environment and minimize our negative impact will make the overall quality of our work better. Next slide, please. So uh, what do we do? Um, well, with the support of CEOPS and funding from Norway, we have developed an environmental assessment and management system in order to get a systematic overview of our environmental impact and emissions. And we did the first round of data collection this spring, and it has been a learning process. We do see that there are a lot of great initiatives and actions taken across our programs in regards to mainstreaming, such as going from diesel generators to solar panels, establishing better waste management, 
and more dialogue with authorities and communities to better assess the environmental impact. But we also see that we need to continue the efforts and continue to build awareness, and especially when it comes to more engagement with local stakeholders in relation to climate change and environmental regulations. And uh, we need to ensure that all the programs are taking a systematic approach to environmental management. As you see from the table in the presentation, I just included data from a few of our programs and a couple of the indicators we use to measure and reduce our impact. And uh, if you look at the total annual kilometers driven, um, in, in reality, just a number of how many kilometers uh, doesn't say that much to people. But if you do a quick calculation, you can actually see that it equates to around 35 times around the world with our cars in, uh, in Bosnia, in this case, uh, which definitely gives a perspective to it, also to our staff when communicating about it. And no doubt there is a potential for us to reduce our footprint in the countries we work. A key priority for us ahead will be to further mainstream environment into our operations. And another is that, um, and as Lucy mentioned earlier, that we, uh, or NPA put in a proposal this spring to amend the current IMS 713 on environment, given it was published five years ago. And we think it can be improved by including climate change and also hopefully more guidance on how to implement. And we are very much looking forward to take part in the upcoming revision of this for the next year. Next slide, please. I also really want to quickly mention innovation as there are so many opportunities, opportunities to innovate, uh, both in terms of reducing emissions, reducing the waste we generate, and prolong the life of the products we buy, uh, but also how we work. And, uh, and we are currently setting up an innovation process and hope to develop the next generation personal protective equipment in mine action, made from more sustainable materials that uh, won't possibly leave toxic substances if disposed to local landfills. Um, and hope, we hope to develop longer, a longer lifetime uh, to the products if it's possible, and also look at the possibilities for recycling the um, equipment. And at the same time, uh, in regards to this, we also want to make sure that it's optimized not only for males, but for females as well. And uh, also here, when it comes to innovation, I think more dialogue with donors and our supply chain, uh, chain are needed. Uh, both in terms of more sustainable investments, because they might have a higher first time cost, but uh, if you look at it from a life cycle perspective, they might be more sustainable and more cost efficient uh, from that perspective. And we also need to look at new business models, because do we really need to buy expensive solar panel systems for all our programs uh, when transferring for uh, transitioning from fossil to renewables? Or is it possible to come up with new business models that, uh, for instance, uh, in regards to product as a services? Could we, for instance, lease solar panel systems and pay a monthly fee for the service instead? Uh, next slide, please. Just a few challenges and opportunities before I give the word to my colleague back. Um, about going green, it does take time to change the mentality of staff and employees because people's priorities have initially been somewhere else. At the end, it's been about, or it is about saving lives and helping people and communities. And then when it comes to environmental mainstreaming, we now ask our staff to do even more and report even more. So getting the, to, uh, the staff or buy-in from staff is extremely important. And this requires training on environmental safeguarding, on climate change and communication. What is fantastic is that we see that our staff are extremely motivated for this work, especially among our younger staff. And next slide, please. Um, climate change and how it will impact regionally is a real challenge for us because it will make it more difficult to prioritize and plan for serving clearance. And um, an important question here is, how do we ensure that decisions and priorities that are made today are considering both the short-term needs, but also the longer-term consequences of climate change that we will see in 10 to 20, 30 years 
for instance, in terms of flooding, increased sea level and resettlement. Risk assessments related to this is key, but we also need more cooperation and dialogue with national authorities, operators and owners here. Thank you so much. Thank you, Christine. Uh, I would like to uh, continue with uh, the, uh, some of the uh, initiative from NPA Vietnam from a country context in terms of environment and climate change. Uh, hello, everyone. My name is uh, Bach. I'm currently Norwegian People's Aid in Vietnam Environmental Protection Officers. So NPA Vietnam has been an active my action operators in Vietnam for 15 years. We are working in four provinces and our operation includes uh, non-technical survey, technical survey, battle area clearance, spot tasks and capacity development. Uh, we have learned many lessons and experience from our projects uh, into, uh, for environment and climate that we are very happy to share in this site event. Next slide, please. So Vietnam is uh, identified by the International Governmental Panel of Climate Change as one of the most affected countries by climate change. Areas where we are now operating have been distressed from the impact of climate change and beneficiaries of my action are living in climate change vulnerable areas of Vietnam and probably be suffering from it. Next, please. So these photos are taken by our staff around their homes in the 2020 historic flood. Three provinces of Vietnam where NPA is operating suffer heavily during this time. We have to stand down for several weeks and in many areas, the water level was up to the roof of buildings. Next, please. There are many people in central Vietnam who are still living with the impact of Asian Orange, up to 3 million people have been born with disabilities. Picture here is Mr. Chum from Quang Chi province with his family. Four of his five children are severely impacted by Asian orange. The family's house was submerged in the flood water for days. And Mr. Chum, who is the sole income earner, was not able to go to work to provide for his family. Not only Asian orange victim, EO victims are also extremely vulnerable to the consequences of climate change. Next, please. Another serious threat is landslide and flash floods caused by heavy rain. These photos show the severe damage caused by landslide in Quang Chi province. Landslide can transport explosive ordnance to locations that have been cleared and released for civilian use. The mapping of confirmed hazardous area can become incorrect if the area suffers from landslide or sludge. Additionally, the other consequences of climate change include intense heat, heavy rain could increase the rate of corrosion, making the explosive ordnance unstable or unidentifiable. Next, please. As a well-established my action actor in Vietnam, with 15 years working with provincial and national authorities and local partners, we have acquired extensive experience in survey, impact assessment, risk education, capacity development, and unique opportunities to go home by home. For collecting data, we have high level of expertise in uh, information management, uh, data analysis, and database development. These are significant features that not many organizations are able to offer. And moreover, the my action sector in Vietnam are increasingly promoting environmental safeguarding and climate change in its agenda. Next, please. So our first step, very first step is we develop a strategy based on our uh, MPA global environment and climate policy in which we identified clearly our direct and objectives. Our strategies take a two-tier approach. So we would like to improve NPA Vietnam own action to better protect the environment in which we conduct my action activities. This must include the, re the reduce of impact to environment and create an environmental monitoring system. Second, we would like to ensure the sustainability of my action operation. 
by working with communities to manage the land sustainably and other resources. Next, please. So to take into action, uh, we provide environment and climate change training to all the staff to increase their knowledge and awareness. And this creates a momentum from the core of the organization. As of today, all MPA Vietnam national staff have been trained. We also develop environmental monitoring system to keep track of our greenhouse gas emission from flights, vehicles, and also our energy use from all the programs. From this, we can identify sources that can be reduced and should be reduced. One of the most uh, important thing is to understand the environmental context of the country. By keeping in contact with environmental actors at international, national, and local levels, we exchange information and we explore opportunity for a shared efforts in supporting communities during and after the conclusion of migration operation. Next, please. We also need to reach out to migration operators in the country by establishing a working group. So the My Action Working Group in Vietnam has environment task force that includes uh, international and national operators like MAP, P3, and MPA, and all the important stakeholders like the US Embassy. This is a platform to share experience, knowledge, and best practice in reducing footprints of My Action operations. Authorities also need to be influenced with our dedication to environment by bringing it up in multiple meetings and actual activities. The Vietnam Action Center requested a lecture on climate change and my action, particularly on how my action programs can adapt to the consequences of climate change. Furthermore, this is also our opportunity to present the IMAS 7.13 on environment management in my action to show the authorities the need to adapt this into country uh, national standard. Next, please. One of uh, our significant uh, project is soil sampling post clearance in uh, Hue province. We collaborate with a local university to study on the long-term impact of munition by testing heavy metal concentration of the soil under a concluded the uh, battle area clearance size. The existence of toxic substance, including heavy metals in military impacted sites, uh, was found by many studies. IMAS is also aware of this matter. However, the lack of data have made mitigation measures extremely challenging to be identified and executed. This is why MPA Vietnam stepped in with local actors to investigate the problem for data and further mitigation if needed. Besides, this study also provides information on soil nutrients properties. This suggests local people to use their land based on data-driven and evidence-based manner. Next, please. So the study show that MPA Vietnam has the capacity to include the gathering of environment and climate change data into our programs. Existing my action resources, such as non-technical survey skills, uh, survey 123, ArcGIS database management can be utilized. This soil sampling was not only able to identify the possibility of soil contamination, but also provide soil information to my action beneficiaries. The soil info assists civilians in what types of plant to cultivate that can generate highest yield or best for flood resistance or what type of fertilizer is needed. To authorities, this data allows them to better planning of land use and social economic development. Next, please. With, with expertise obtained from previous activities, NPA Vietnam will experiment a new survey method, which we named the Total My Action Survey, TMAS. This method combines our successful non-technical survey, NTS, with the EOIE, Explosive Ordnance Risk Education, Victim Ass Assistance Survey, uh, Climate Change Resiliency, Identification. These will be conducted throughout the entire action operation, including before and after our clearance works. This also contains environment response activities where environment 
or climate change risk is identified through the survey. It may include, for example, soil sampling and analysis, training on sustainable land management for landowners, waste management solution, uh, remediation of natural areas, including tree plantings. The result of this activity can be reported to IMSMA and provincial authorities and environmental actors can easily access to environmental data obtained from this survey. Besides that, we are also doing some research and development to reduce the impact of uh, explosive open demolition. We now have the mobile bomb cutting machine, which we can cut the, the large aircraft bomb or mortar to uh, gather the explosive and then neutralize it uh, uh, in the future with uh, some chemical uh, substance that can neutralize safe. So that is from NPA Vietnam. Many thanks for listening. Thank you so much, Kristen and Beck. Um, next up, we have um, our second poll. You have 20 seconds to answer this one. Five more seconds. Great, thank you so much. And I also want to um, remind everyone in the audience to please type any questions that you might have and we'll do our very best um, to get to them uh, during the Q&A portion. So next up, um, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Andrew Scanlon. Andrew is a senior international environmental project manager and conservation management expert, including sustainability, climate, waste management, um, and WASH, uh, technical lead at the HALO Trust. Andrew is from Ireland. He has over 22 years of experience in the private sector, nonprofits, governments, and the United Nations. Uh, his key skills are in environmental science and biodiversity conservation management. He worked extensively on environmental assessment tools and method, environmental impact assessments, and strategic environment assessment reporting, um, use of GIS and knowledge management system to create decision support and planning tools for conservation projects at national level down to specific local impact projects. Uh, today, Andrew will be sharing with us um, the Halo Trust initiative state and priorities going forward. Andrew, you're up. Thank you. Can I confirm that you can see my presentation? Uh, no, not yet. Andrew, do you want me to share my screen? Uh, yes, easy? please. Okay, good morning, afternoon and evening, everybody, wherever you are. And some quick slides from Halo Trust in terms of what we're doing specifically on our environment brief. And thanks to all colleagues for sharing some of the global, the strategic, and some country level specifics of what we're already doing. And I thought it would make sense for my presentation to focus on some of our small scale impact projects that we're using to demonstrate good practice simple, uh, meaningful work that can help us to learn in a, a global context. So our byline is how can HALO respond effectively to the environment conflict crisis, also the climate crisis, of course, how do we benchmark our own environment impact and how do we achieve sustainability? Not forgetting that we're in a, a humanitarian mine action charity. So if we try to do everything, we'll end up doing nothing. Uh, what is our strategic approach? What is a, a portfolio, learning by doing, for conservation and environment? Not, not forgetting the Paris Agreement, climate change, the CBD, the Convention on Biological Diversity, which is of particular interest to most of the locations, the countries and the regions where we work. And we don't do that alone. We're a mine action charity. So what about partnerships? 
we've 10,000 staff in 170 locations, 29 countries. But what human resources do we currently have, especially national staff, local staff, uh, and local counterparts, the human resources angle. We don't want to reinvent the wheel by writing new standards. We have IMAS, which as Sarah mentioned, was uh, sort of, or, and Lucy as well, updated about five years ago or, or launched five years ago, but probably written 10 years ago. So it's definitely out of date. We also in Halo have an environment standard, but to what extent we use that, especially when we talk, start talking and thinking outside of the mine ban treaty, and we start thinking about cluster munitions and other mine action work that we do. So updating sources of information, what are those networks? Do we tap into them? Uh, let's not reinvent the wheel. The environment marker is a tool that we're launching at a small scale, local scale. That's not going to be a silver bullet for environment in mine action. It's actually more to flag for location managers, for country managers. Day-to-day -day project issues and what we call housekeeping issues. We don't use earth observation enough in mine action and in terms of linking environment and climate tapping into remote sensing airborne sensing itself and in and geographic information science which is one of the interpretations of the acronym another being gis geographic information systems uh, how we really muscle in on that uh, amazing tool and use it more in mine action and environment there's a lot of funding out there and a lot of acronyms out there. How do we navigate them? We are a humanitarian mine action charity. So navigating the funding streams, not just environment, but also conservation resources and funds. Um, this is my, my task for this year and, and for next year. And I'm gonna run through some small scale impact projects that themselves are small, but they tell us something about the portfolio of, of the global environment sector. Next slide, please. I think we might have uh, lost Andrew, Sarah. So while we wait for Andrew, oh, there he is. Andrew, are you back? I'm back, apologies. Welcome, you can go ahead. Hi, Sarah, can you hear me? Yes, you're back. Okay, thank you. Apologies, everybody. Uh, moving along swiftly. We are at the moment, in terms of looking where Halo works in these 170 locations, 29 countries, we're already in global biodiversity hotspots. We're already in parts of the world that are extremely vulnerable to changing climate. And we're already in all of our, our countries and contexts, places that are either coming out of conflict, uh, in conflict, uh, or vulnerable to future conflict. So we don't really need to oversell ourselves. A lot of what we already do as mine action organizations, uh, state level and operators, uh, even commercial, we're already working in very difficult and very challenging situations, and we don't want to make it more difficult. Next slide, please. The Halo's impact project approach so we we don't want to bite off more than we can chew but we want to have enough of a portfolio to be able to talk to larger scale global initiatives including the global 
Climate Fund, uh, the Green Climate Fund, the Global Environment Facility and others. And as you can see from that slide, our small scale impact projects, we've got some thematic projects testing the environment marker, which comes out of the humanitarian environment marker. You may also be familiar with the conflict marker and the gender marker, and then the use of GIS. We don't have a project in the yellow dots, but we have presence, and these are highly critical nature, uh, climate vulnerable, or locations where there's a high likelihood of success for an impact project. Next slide, please. And just some elevator pitches here. We work in from the lowest point on Earth, in the dead, near the Dead Sea to the highest point of Earth, so from Syria to the Himalaya. Uh, 20 global biodiversity hotspots, they're, they're critical ecosystem partnership fund countries. 20 of our countries are in the Notre Dame Index for vulnerability. All of our countries are part of the World Bank Nairobi, the World Bank Hub for Fragile States, priority countries. We have more big cat species in our areas of operation than all of Africa. We have, all of our countries are in landlocked nations, Laos, uh, sorry, 35% are in landlocked nations, and these are Laos, Afghanistan, Central African Republic, South Sudan, Zim, Malawi, Nagorno-Karabakh, Bosnia, Herzegovina, Kosovo, Chechnya, and to some extent Ukraine, if you think about the Black Sea ports being blocked as um, creating a, an island type or landlocked type uh, situation in Ukraine. 10 of our countries are in the least developed country category. That really highlights in terms of selling environment mine action in challenging, difficult and dangerous places. It, it's really obvious and important, um, but what to do about it, linking environment and mine action. Next slide, please. Uh, just There's about three slides here, just very quickly on the jargon approach. And without more acronyms, we do need to start to learn and, and understand the, what, how the environment community globally thinks and talks, uh, which allows us then to tap into more global initiatives. So we don't necessarily talk about mine action and sanitation, sewage or, or sludge or solid waste management. We talk about environment health and then linking that to waste management. And the buzzword at the moment in terms of wash is waste to value. And in Syria, in Afghanistan, in Laos, we're tapping into that language. Lao, carbon, climate, clean energy, Afghanistan, environment, health, and waste management, Syria, environment, health, and waste management. Uh, next slide, please. We also operate in countries that are known for traditional nature conservation initiatives. Kenya, uh, work that we do on uh, across the north. Angola, which is part of the Zambezi, uh, Okavango Delta, the Delta region, the upper of the historically, botanically, and in terms of fauna, richest places in the world for biodiversity. And in those rangeland areas, uh, we're working predominantly on the border regions, so rehabilitating that area. Traditional, high-profile nature conservation initiatives, where most of the big five conservation organizations cannot and will not be able to operate. So the role of mine action agencies in mine action, but then enriching our work with environment uh, initiatives. Next slide, please. And then charismatic topics and difficult and dangerous contexts where there's fragility. Abkhazia, of course, politically. Somalia, extremely challenging place to work, but also the homeland of frankincense and mir and the Boswellian woodland systems. So developing nature-based community supported solutions in and around where we as a minor action organization work and associating that with frankincense conservation or uh, economic non-timber uh, forest conservation initiatives, conservation master planning. Next slide, please. Coastal zones, more jargon here, but restoration and conservation in coastal zones. These are areas, for example, in Sri Lanka, El Salvador, where we do work, uh, which are also uh, in terms of uh, meeting climate and biodiversity national and global targets. Coastal zones are much more biodiverse and much more have much more potential for climate action in terms of disaster risk reduction or in terms of sequestering carbon than almost any other ecosystem on, in, on the planet. Conservation of virgin coastal systems, preferential to any large scale planting efforts, 
And then in terms of Mangrove or the science and the partnership approach there, it's a really great opportunity for Halo to employ um, larger numbers of local people, our own staff, whether it's in survey teams, our traditional mine action workers, and for life and preparing them for life after mine action. Next slide, please. And I think this is a, a simple one, but an important one. Cambodia, 40% of the country targeted in their National Environment Action Plan to be protected in nature reserves, protected areas, and community managed forest systems. So tropical dry forest is not a, a term we hear a lot in mine action, but it happens to be the whole that whole ecosystem between Thailand and Cambodia across the north. And there isn't great examples of, of successful community forestry management. Red plus, which is a, a climate change financing term, and just tapping into that. We already uh, work extensively in Cambodia for almost three decades. So the work that we would continue to do there would be enriching our environment work in the same locations. And that's it. The thematic areas, as mentioned, the environment marker, learning from humanitarian context and using earth observation a lot more in, in uh, mine action work. Uh, this is our summary. So again, building on our capital, junior experts, where there are gaps, we need to partner, where there are operational gaps, work a lot more at the local level. And then I think the last point is a, an important one. I call it disinter disintermediatization. So from going from our global programs to very local without too many subcontractors and partner organizations and sub subcontractors in many cases. So to what extent we can disintermediatize and, and move from global finance or activities and expertise to very, very local. I'll stop there. Thank you very much, everybody. Thanks so much, Andrew. Um, Halo is such a great partner of Legacies and we look forward to seeing you on Laos this year. Um, before we go to our final speaker, I have the poll up and it's gonna, only going to stay up for 12 seconds. Three more seconds. Thank you. Thank you so much. These have been so much fun. Okay, so next up, um, we have Lindsay Cottrell. Uh, Lindsay is the environmental, environmental policy officer at the UK-based charity, the Conflict and Environment Observatory, or CEOBS for short, and is a charter environmentalist. Before joining CEOBS in 2019, she worked in the environmental consultancy sector for over 25 years on connect on contaminated land environment due diligence and environmental risk assessment. Uh, today, um, Lindsay will be sharing climate change and mine action, the issues, examples, uh, climate risk tools, and updated need to IMAS. Uh, thank you, Lindsay. You're up. Thank you very much, Sarah, for the introductions. Um, I'll try and be a little speed up a little bit because I know we're running out of time and I hope people can hang on a bit longer um, for the Q&A section afterwards. It's really encouraging to hear about the initiative taking place. We know there's a lot still to be done. Um, this graph, um, as Sarah suggested, <laughs> um, um, hints at what I want to talk specifically about which of course climate change and the and um the risks we're facing so the global um temperature rise since the mid 19th century has been around about 1.1 degree centigrade it may not sound much but once we pass one and a half degrees of heating we reach this tipping point and there is this increased risk of rapid irreversible climate disruption so this includes more frequent and extreme weather meaning risks to people biodiversity and food security so what does this mean for mine action? Well, climate change has an impact across all sectors and aspects of society. Right now, we're seeing the devastating floods across Pakistan, estimated to have affected a third of the country and more than 30 million people. Um, the World Economic Forum's um, Global Risk Report from um, early this year is based on responses from over a thousand experts. And over the next 10 years, environmental risks are perceived to be the most critical long-term threats to the world with climate action failure 
extreme weather and biodiversity loss ranking in the top three most severe risks. So even with geopolitical tension, climate change is viewed as the gravest threat to humanity with potential to inflict the most damage at a global scale uh, over the next decade. Um, so not to be a scaremonger, but I just want to um, re-emphasize the important point of climate change. For my inaction, um, we're already seeing this as a reality, as Bak mentioned earlier in his um, presentation with the examples from um, Vietnam. Um, we're seeing reports of how climate change has affected both areas contaminated with explosive ordnance and how it's affected mine action activities. Um, these examples aren't specific to um, cluster munitions, but um, whether it's heavy rain or landslides in Vietnam, um, floods in Cambodia, Laos, Bosnia, wildfires or droughts, these can all influence um, the risks posed to mine action operators and local people. Um, it can dictate survey and clearance tech clearance techniques used, the choice of equipment and program timetables and the prioritization needs. And we should not underestimate and we cannot ignore, as I think we all know from the poll responses that we all um, saw previously, um, we cannot ignore the risks from extreme weather and climate change. So the latest um, UNMAS annual report does recognise these climate change risks to mine action colleagues, although it states that droughts, floods, heat waves, sandstorms and population displacements have taken a toll, have taken a toll, it did not stop operations, but this may not always be the case and mine action programmes um, are they are they properly prepared? We don't know fully, I don't think. Are the, and are the risks being communicated to local people? So, um, as Lucy mentioned, the Laws and Action Plan, um, it does address such um, climate change considerations. This is cited under um, risk education and the importance of considering an increased risk of exposure due to climate change. Action 30 covers the adaptation of risk education initiatives due to um, changing circumstances, which means taking account of risks caused by climate change. But to communicate risk, obviously you need to know what the risk is and take steps to mitigate that risk as far as possible. So nine, national mine action standards must therefore include measures to assess, address and manage climate change risks. So it's excellent that we already have an IMAS on environmental management. 0713, as mentioned earlier, this was published back in 2017 and it's planned to be and the planned update is needed. So um, MPA um, did put a proposal forward to update this, which was approved, and we hope this will lead to um, a broadening definition of the term environment, um, inclusion of guidance on the planning for and um, adoption of climate change mitigation measures, the inclusion of climate risk and adaptation planning for operators and the consideration of climate vulnerability of communities and how climate resilience can be embedded following land clearance. So here I'm gonna summarize what I think are the three important elements for climate risk management in mine action. Firstly, um, there's the knowledge from local communities. So what changes have already been experienced? What information is available through say non-technical surveys and other engagement? with perhaps regional authorities, environment ministers and ministries, other environmental agencies and civil society organisations. And what mapping and climate risk tool, tools can be used to support planning and programming. programming. So everyone loves a Venn, um, a Venn diagram, I'm sure. Um, so with each of these, um, when we consider each of these, we can develop some appropriate climate action. There are climate risk management tools available, so um, we don't want to re reinvent the wheel. Um, there's tools and guidance from other sectors that can be used and applied. Um, these may not be perfect, but they can be useful and adapted to support climate risk management in mine action. This is um, what we hope we, um, we hope can happen, working collaboratively, trialing tools and incorporating this into the new guidance, um, new guidance into IMAS um, 0713. Um, we've been scouting around some of the risk tools available. Um, the development um, aid sector is quite a good starting point. This one from USAID is the climate risk management tool, which has been mandatory for all strategies since 2015 and for all new projects since 2016. So the USAID um, climate risk management process is iterative. And as you can see, it's got eight key steps to assess and then manage climate risks. One of the initial steps is to um, identify climate 
risks or impacts. So to identify climate risks, um, climate profiles can be used and there are resources available through USAID, but also through the World Bank um, and through the ICRC, for example. The um, USAID example here for Afghanistan, um, and, it, and it, you can just see that it gives, um, describes the climate stresses and the major types of risks that climate change may pose for a certain country. So climate stresses, for example, may include um, retreating glaciers, increases in snow melts and rainfall changes, changes, increases in temperature droughts, changes in the frequency or intensity of storms. And then, of course, for each of those climate stresses, there's an associated impact. The risk or the potential for negative consequences will depend, obviously, on the um, local geography. So is it mountainous? Is it forested? Is it near a river? Is it near the sea? Is it agricultural? Is it within a floodplain? Is it near a built, built up area? And the risk will depend on the adaptive capacity of the area and the community. And these impacts, um, these are just, just examples and it's not exhaustive. Um, but not only should there be consideration of how climate change may impact mine action activities, but also, of course, how it may affect where people may choose to live. Um, will people move? Will their habits change? How will land be used? How will water resources and other natural resources be exploited? So um, for risk, uh, climate risk rating, um, uh, Andrew alluded to about the use of kind of open source data, um, satellite images, etc. So open source data and data gathering, say through non-technical surveys, as Back mentioned as well, through their total mine action survey um, plans for an MPA, will inform these risk ratings. Um, and in areas where there is an increased um, surface water uh, surface water runoff or flooding events? Um, are there steep slopes, for example? Is there increased risk of landslides, say due to high rates of tree color, cover loss? This is a screenshot, I have shown it on previous presentations, but I think it's really powerful. It's from EarthMap, which shows tree cover loss in Cambodia near the Thai border since 20, um, 2020. So the red area shows the high rates of deforestation. And when you've got higher rates of deforestation, you've got an increased risk of landslides and flooding risks may also increase. So quantitatively assessing climate risks is very difficult um, due to the uncertainty about the magnitude or severity and the likelihood or probability of climate impacts occurring. But um, risk rating can be determined by considering these severities and the likelihoods of the impact occurring. And then unacceptable um, risks um, can then be addressed, mitigated where possible, and of course those risks communicated. So to summarise, I'm sorry I've rattled through this, um, climate risk needs um, integrating into mine action strategies and into prioritization. We will need to include consideration how climate change may affect where people live, um, land use practices and habits. Um, so there are existing tools available and um, can be adopted, adapted for mine action. Um, climate risk management must plan for these uncertainties. Climate risk management means programming for a range of possible future climate scenarios and building in that flexibility to adjust and adapt. So trialing um, some of these climate risk tools is now needed. Um, this figure that I have here is one that Peace Trees in Vietnam um, developed, um, drew up a few, uh, a few months ago. Um, this overlays um, confirmed hazardous areas with um, satellite um, detected surface water. And this is following the October 2020 storms across Quang Tri province. So um, Peace Trees hopes to plan to trial some of these tools, tools for districts in Vietnam, and we hope to work them on part of that. And hopefully we can report back on, that, on how those tools um, can work. And then those lessons learned should be fed back into um, hopefully the IMS updates. So just before I finish, I just wanted to mention about our um, informal working group that we have on environmental issues. When you finish this webinar, you will get a, um, a email and it will um, remind you about this. And we have a next meeting in October. I really encourage you to join if you have this is of interest. We need as many people to get engaged and um, raise awareness across all of the actors about the environmental issues. Um, and there is also a LinkedIn group. So please do think about joining our next meeting. 
Thank you very much, Sarah. Thank you so much, Lindsay. Um, I learned so much from you every time we speak, and I'm sure our audience really appreciate the useful information as well. So uh, reminding our audience here um, to please type in any questions and we'll try our best to get to it. Uh, with that, uh, Kristen is the first to be on the hot seat. So Kristen, our first question goes to you. Uh, for audience listening in today um, that wants to do more for mainstreaming the environment and climate change into mine action and contribute to fulfilling the commitments to the Lawson um, Action Plan, what could they do to start? Uh, well, um, I think as a, as a start, uh, increasing the awareness and competence on climate change and environmental impact among both the management and staff through, for instance, trainings and the sharing of best practices in, is one way to start in order to slowly integrate and adapt the work. And there are many, uh, there are many good free online learning courses. And as Lindsay said, uh, just mentioned, I want to really encourage everyone to join the informal environment and mind action working group, uh, which is a really good arena to, to share best practices and to get more knowledge. Uh, but in order to more systematically take into account the environmental impact, uh, for instance, of survey and clearance, getting in place an environmental management system in order to identify, assess, and mitigate the risks and, uh, and potential negative impacts is important. And, and as Buck, my colleague in Vietnam said as well, uh, understanding the regional and local context uh, is key too. And uh, from NPA's parts, we are more than happy to share our environmental assessment and management tools with anyone who is interested. Uh, it can also be found on the Mine Action Monitor webpage, but we are currently revising the tools and indicators after having trialed it throughout the program. So, but we will make sure to update the files on the Mine Action Monitor webpage as well when ready. Well, uh, getting in place such a system will allow you to identify risks and mitigate them. And it also allows you uh, to get a baseline of where you are at the moment. And I think. At the end, uh, what also needs to be done is uh, uh, incorporating climate change related hazards and risk management into the national mine action strategies and standards. Thank you. Great, thank you so much. Um, next, Beck, uh, I want to direct this question to you. Um, as the environment and climate change problem is relatively new in mine action sector, how should an operator start its environment or climate change movement without the expertise in the matter? Yeah, thank you, Sarah. I think that's a very good question. It's, uh, I think it it's happens, it occurs to every mine action operator so when they encounter this uh, environment and climate change problem. So if uh, possible, I think this is the first thing you should uh, uh, collaborate or find opportunity to work with the local or international environmental climate change actors within the areas of operation. Like in Vietnam, we have uh, uh, even we have me as a dedicated personnel for environment, but we also need additional resources from other actors, such as uh, we have worked with the university uh, in Hue here. We also uh, collaborate with the Huefo, which is, uh, uh, they have uh, plenty of coordination with uh, other donors in climate and uh, environment. So I think, one of the most important thing is to understand the context and to work with other environmental actors. Uh, do not work alone, just collaborate is, I think, the key to success in this uh, climate change environment. Great, thank you so much for that advice. Um, next question goes to Lindsay. Lindsay, uh, what do you think are the key problems trying to get climate risk management integrated into mine action programs and is the, is the climate projection data there to support assessments? Uh, thanks, Sarah. Um, yeah, so to take the first bit then, um, I think 
one of the key problems really will be um, understanding where the responsibility sits for undertaking these climate risk assessments. So um, is it mine action authorities? Is it um, mine action operators? Um, is it donors even? Um, but I, I actually think it's a shared responsibility. You know, the donors should be asking that this should be covered. Um, likewise, mine action um, operators should be thinking about, well, obviously it's safeguarding their own operation, op operatives um, and also it's it's a, a must for my national authorities as well so um, that's the one thing um, but then um, then you know this need for engagement and awareness I think there's still um, there's still some uncertainty as to how mine action and climate change um, actually interrelate so the more we can provide um, examples of um, incidents and where we've seen um, extreme weather events actually affecting mine action areas and how this has impacted programs is important as well. Um, and on the on the point about um, climate projection data available, um, yeah, it's um, it's not going to be perfect because they are projections and the um, resources that are available there on profile con countries is very high level. But I think it's it's good enough. For what we need to do at the moment there's a there is an absence and it needs to be embedded in there and i think even if we start using the high risk um the high level data sets um it's a good best fit and it's a good starting point so i don't think we should be worried about not getting it right first time thank you great thank you so much Lindsay. um i there was one question um sorry uh I can't seem to find the question from the audience, um, but Lucy, I believe you saw that question and would be willing to answer that. Um, so <laughs> take it mm -hmm. away. Yeah, I can uh, read it out. It's from uh, uh, Paul Hannon from uh, Minds Action Canada. Um, and his question is um, that I mentioned that there's a brief, just a brief reference to the environment in CCM. And is the same true of the Mine Ban Treaty? Are these the only disarmament treaties referencing the environment? Or are there others that we might learn from? Um, I think, as Paul says, the uh, Mine Ban Treaty uh, doesn't have much of a reference to the environment. It's very similar to the CCM. Really, it's the Lausanne Action plan that, that has kind of moved it forward in terms of those two treaties. Um, as far as I know, um, uh, amended protocol two and protocol five of the CCW doesn't even reference environment. Um, uh, the uh, treaty on the prohibition of nuclear weapons, I think has remedial um, environmental re mediation as a result of um, use and testing, but of course that's a, a slightly different nature of uh, contamination. Um, but it's an interesting question, and I guess to say that, um, you know, the states that are state parties to the treaties, they're also guided by other um, international agreements, such as the Paris Agreement, uh, the Sendai Framework for Disaster Risk Reduction, UN Sustainable Development Goals, and then other uh, relevant international law and standards, um, international human rights law, international IHL. Um, so there are definitely other international um, frameworks that really can help uh, match in with mine action and guide our, our work on that as well. Thanks. Thank you so much, Lucy. And thank you to just our panel of experts. I really appreciate the work that you all are doing and all the great research. Um, once uh, this is actually being recorded, so once we share it, please continue to help us reshare this um, and amplify this very, very important discussion. Thank you all so much for tuning in today. And for those who are still um, who are there in Geneva with the Convention on Cluster Munition, uh, please enjoy your time. I uh, look forward to seeing you all. Uh, thank you so much for joining us for day two and um, today's SCI event. Have a good one. Bye. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank Bye. You. See you, Lucy. Have fun in Geneva. Thanks, Lindsay. I'll catch up with you soon. <laughs>